Thank you very much for joining uh, this One Yorkshire webinar. My name's Sophie Metcalf, um, and this is, well, I've done this under the FemPowered Collective banner, um, and I'll explain in a moment, but FemPowered Collective is a new brand that we launched in the last couple of months, um, and it's a branch of our current business, the Soapy Group, and we are aiming to help more women find the confidence to start a business, um, especially over the last 12 months. A lot of people have uh, wanted to try new things. They've either left their jobs um, through no fault of their own, through redundancies, etc. cetera. Um, and there's a lot of women out there who are wanting to try their hand at running their own business, starting from the kitchen table. So that's what FemPower Collective is all about. It's helping women find that confidence and gain all the skills that they need to start their business. But that's me and that's my partner, Simon. So I'm Sophie, member of the Chartered Institute of Marketing. I like to show off now because I've very recently become a, mem a member of the Chartered Institute of Marketing. Um, so I can put letters after my name. So <laughs> thought I'd just point that out because I'm gloating a little bit. Um, and that's Simon. And we are together, the Soapy Group, which is a small marketing consultancy based just outside York. And we've got clients all across the UK um if you want to check us out we're also web developers as well uh fempower collective comes under the sophie group banner we're also hubspot providers so hubspot is a crm which is a, a customer relationship management system one of the best out there that's why we've become a provider so anybody in need or looking for crm solutions please come and have a chat with us and we'll point you in the right direction and we're also wordpress experts as well um and part of the chartered institute of marketing so my situation today, for those of you who uh, didn't quite hear before, a little bit of a situation today that um, I've had to come to the office by myself. So I'm sat here by myself and I've had to bring the dog with me. It's just circumstance today. So I thought I'd put his face there. So if he barks, you can forgive him because he has that face. He's absolutely gorgeous. He's called Chewy. Um, so he's my little sidekick today. So I do apologize if he barks. <laughs> Just the nature of the beast at the moment. It's the perils of uh, of what we're all going through at the moment. Um, so yeah, that's that. Hopefully not too many distractions today. Other webinars that I am running, um, there's one coming up in two weeks through the Yorkshire Mafia. So you will sign up through the Yorkshire Mafia website again. Scale up your marketing strategy on the 5th of March at the same time. Um, and that's all about, I'm doing that under the Soapy Group banner. And that is explaining about what a marketing strategy um, is all about, especially if you're an established SME or an established organization, um, doesn't matter what size, and you're wanting to step up your marketing efforts. And a big part of, a big theme of that um, webinar is all gonna be about resourcing and the skills that you need to think about and budgeting um, to make sure that your marketing falls in line with your business growth ambitions. And then I'm also doing an International Women's Day talk on Monday the 8th at two o'clock. I'll send the link out after this webinar for this because you sign up for this through Eventbrite. And I'm going to be alongside a panel of incredible female leaders. Um, and I am going to be spending about 15 minutes within that. It's a two hour event online held on Zoom. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about embracing a fresh start which falls in line with Fempowered Collective and everything that we're doing, helping women to start their own business. So today then we're talking about content. So this is the second webinar. I did sort of a two part webinar series. Um, the first one, if you were a part of that, please just show me a, a, a show of hands if you were on that uh, webinar. Um, yeah, lots of you were there, fantastic. I'm so glad. We're gonna do a little bit of a recap of what we talked about. So we talked about strategy, um a content marketing strategy so it was very much the strategic thinking side today i'm going to go a little bit more into the creative process um and what to think about and in particular um social media so this webinar hopefully will be um it's it's less crammed with information the first webinar was absolutely cram packed with strategy because there's so much to think about and i had to try and fit it into an hour this one there's less content ironically um but I want lots of time for questions. So if you've got a question as we go along, I'm going to try and answer them as I go along. But at the end, I'd love it if we could do a bit of a Q&A session because every business is different. Every business has different content marketing needs. Um, you've all got your own little niches. So please do um, keep your questions and we'll, we'll do that at the end. Or if you want to fire it into the chat, please do. Um, I'm not very good at multitasking. So sometimes I'll, I'll chat away and realize there's like three questions. So uh, please do bear with me, but I will get to them at the end. 
So for this recipe, you will need, uh, this is everything that you need to think about when you're doing your content marketing strategy. So you need a website, obviously, and a basic understanding of SEO. So a customer facing website that you have access to and either yourself or whoever it is within your organization who has that ability to be able to easily implement the content on your website. So you need a website that you need access to. You would be surprised. Um, a lot of prospective clients over the years that I've started talking to who will come to me for advice about or wanting me to support them with their marketing strategy and their content marketing in particular, but they don't have access. Um, and that is through the access that you're given when you go to a website developer. Um, every website developer works differently. Every web agency will work differently. Um, and there are some out there who just downright refuse to give clients any access to their website because obviously they want the right to be able to look after your content for you, which, you know, they have the right to do that. But obviously that's not how we work here at the Soapy Group or Fempowered. Um, we're very much, we will build a website for you and you get the amount of access that you need. Um, so that's something to think about. And then obviously the, the people within your organization with the skills to be able to update that content as well. And you have to have, you have to think that it's sort of 50% creative and 50% technical skills. Um, and then social media as well. You need a knowledge of social media. If you use social media within your organization, we're gonna talk, cover quite a lot of social media today. Um, and then I put CRM on there. That's, you know, I always advise having a really good customer relationship management system um, to be able to keep track and be able to work with your customers and build those relationships. Um, not essential, but something that I always recommend. So my marketing mantras, um, some of these slides were in the previous webinar, but there's just, just a couple that I'm gonna recap um, because it helps just give a bit of context for today. So my marketing mantras, there is no right or wrong way. There's only efficiency and effectiveness. You must test and refine your content strategy over time. There is no magic wand. There is no silver bullet that's going to make your content strategy work overnight. This is something that you have to implement and think about as a long term um, thing. Be realistic with your time and resources. That is the big theme within my next webinar. Um, it's the, the big sticking point, really. It's the hurdle where, you know, small businesses want this big elaborate marketing strategy they've got loads of ideas but then actually they don't have the time or the people within the, the business to be able to actually put it together so then they just they fall down at that hurdle and just because you can doesn't mean you should so a quick recap then of content strategy this is what we went through before we talked through all these various steps so goals and objectives would be the first step um, you've got to think about whether you're wanting to gain leads from your content, whether you're wanting to grow your email database, increase your traffic or grow your audience. Then you go through the research process. You do your customer research. You get to know exactly what they want from you, the keyword research. What are they asking Google? And then looking at your competitors as well. And then you start the planning process. So thinking about your content timelines, all the channels that you're going to use, your budgets, your costs, your skills and resources again. Then the produ production, so this is where you actually sit there and you create, this is the time that you have to put in and that's where you have to be realistic um, with your time scale and what your time availability is to be able to create all this content because it does take a lot of time. And then analyzing and then refining and going back around the circle again. So this is where you're measuring how effective your content strategy is, measuring all your KPIs against your business objectives, or against your strategy objectives rather, um, and looking at what's working, what isn't working, where are the gaps, what can we do differently, is this worth our time, is the big question. So what is content? I split this into three sections. You've got your brand or your descriptive content, your curated content, and then user-generated content. So brand and descriptive content is everything that is describing your brand, it is selling your brand to your customers. So things like your, your company information, product descriptions, services, it, all the information is there that the customer is gonna get all those answers of what you do and how you're gonna help them. Um, and it's gonna build that trust. Then there's the curated content, things like your news and PR, blogs, how-to guides, eBooks, your downloadable content, um, video images, all that we're gonna go through a little bit more in more detail. And user-generated content as well, I'm gonna to touch on this today. 
things like reviews, using influencers and partnership marketing, and then forums as well, things like Facebook groups. So good content is useful, informative, and timely information that's easy to find and easy to understand. So that's a very quick recap of what we talked about in the last webinar. Um, so let's talk now about why we need content. So these are some stats that have come from HubSpot. Um, stats like this, I always say take with a pinch of salt because it might not, we, I don't actually know what organizations they surveyed or how they figured this out. You know, you never do with these, um, these types of stats, but what I can say from experience and from my expertise is that it's on the right track. So content marketing brings in three times as many leads as traditional marketing and costs 62% less. I can understand that. The more content that you put out there, the more leads, um, the more leads that you are likely to get. I don't know if you can hear in the background, but my dog Chewy has got a bone and he's chewing it really loudly. I don't know if you can hear that. It keeps cutting me off. <laughs> Bless him. Um, let's persevere. So SMEs that use content marketing get 126% more leads than those that don't. 61% of online purchases are the direct result of a customer reading a blog. That I do absolutely believe, um, whether the 61% is accurate, but I do believe that things like blogs, informative blogs, how-to guides do build that trust between the customer and business. And they are more likely to come to you because they know that you know what you're talking about. No matter what your product or service is, your customer builds that trust and believes that you know what you're talking about, then they're gonna to come to you. And then again, take this with a pinch of salt, companies that publish 16 blog posts per month get three and a half times more traffic than those that post four or fewer posts per month. So again, this has to work within your time and resourcing constraints within your business. But that just proves the more you put out there, the more content you put out there, the more engagement you're going to get, you're going to build your audience up a lot more um, and you're going to build more trust. But obviously, I'm not saying there that you should go away and you should aim to do 16 blog posts per month, because for a lot of small businesses, that's just not going to work. You're not going to be able to do that. Um, but it is just something maybe to work towards the more, you know, work towards a strategy where you're going to build up your content bank over time. So I keep talking about trust signals. Um, trust signals is everything that your audience uses to make a decision about your brand before you, before they buy. So with your website, a trust signal is the speed of the website, how quick it is to load, the design, how pretty is it? How, how nice does it feel? Usability or what we call in the industry UX, your user experience. The content on there, obviously we're gonna come on to that product descriptions, how good are they? Do they answer all the questions? If the customer looks at a product or a service on your website and they feel they have to pick up the phone and ask you more questions, then it's not doing its job. So you have to make sure that the content on your website describes everything, has all the specifications, everything that the customer is gonna ask, you need all that on there. Your brand values, are they reflected within the content on your website? Is your website secure? That is a major trust signal. Have you got your SSL certificate? Um, a customer isn't going to give you any details if they don't feel like your website is secure, if they don't feel like um, that you're trustworthy enough to have their information. So you've got to make sure that those security signals are there, particularly if you're taking payments. So using things like PayPal, Apple Pay, making sure you're using a secure um, and, you know, well-known, well-recognized payment gateway as well um is is a really really crucial part of selling online things like certifications accreditations and partnerships as well make sure they're really visible because that builds trust with your um with your customers or your audience the content on your website then so all your curated content is it valuable the customer is going to say is this valuable is this worth my time to read does this company know what they're talking about that's what the customer is going to be asking themselves is it well written is it littered with spelling mistakes? I've actually done that on purpose. I chuckled to myself when I wrote that. I try and like to think I'm a comedian. Um, you know, if you've got loads of spelling mistakes on your website, on the content that you're putting out there, on your blogs, on your social media posts, if you've got spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes, it doesn't look good. You don't look professional to your audience. So you have to make sure that everything is perfect and professional. And then you've got customer generated content 
can be a really good trust signal as well. So things like testimonials, making sure they're curated and look and presented really clearly on your website. You know that other customers or your customers are going to know that other customers had a really good, valuable service from you and that they will become your advocate. Um, reviews as well, using review sites. I've highlighted responses. So when you get, you know, it is quite a scary thing putting yourself out there and allowing customers the freedom to review you, but it's so valuable. You will get the odd bad review. It does happen. It does, you, you know, you can't please everybody. You will get somebody who is unhappy with the service that they got from you, no matter what you do. But as long as you are responding to that bad review um, and you're responding in a really professional, you step back, you take the emotion out of it and you respond and you explain the whole situation to the other, you know, the other people. This is what we did to try, you know, really sorry that you feel this way. This is what we did to try and rectify it. Please get in touch again and we'll discuss this further with you. So you have to be seen to be responding to the reviews. Likewise, when you get good reviews, make sure you thank them for it as well, um, because that's always a nice thing to do. So using review sites like Trustpilot, Google, um, there's one called Trustist, which we um, advocate quite a lot, actually. And we've we've put a lot of clients onto Trustist, which is actually a local, it's a Yorkshire based company. They're based in York. Um, and what Trustist does is it compiles all your reviews because you've got all these different review sites. So you may have Trustist, you get reviews on Facebook, you get reviews on Google, you may use something like Howls, um, or you've got industry specific um, review sites where you've got reviews and testimonials on there. What Trustist does is it takes all those feeds and it compiles it into one feed on your website. Um, it looks really professional, it works really well. Um, and it also massively helps your SEO um, locally. If you're a local business and you rely on um, local trade, people finding you locally, it's really good for your SEO as well. So it's something if you want more information, please do get in touch about Trustist. We have no affiliation with them. I'll just, I'll just advocate them. Um, case studies as well. Forums are really good, allowing your customers to talk and have conversations with them, with each other and talk about how great you are. That's, um, you know, it's a really, really valuable tool. I've got an amazing example of that coming up later. Um, and then influencers and endorsements as well is really valuable, a really valuable trust signal. So with social media, what are the trust signals with social media? So a customer may stumble across your Facebook page um, and they're going to look at things like your audience size, or they may not, but if you've got a, a slightly larger audience size, say you've got a thousand followers, that psychologically looks better than if you only had 20 people following your page because you look like a more trustworthy brand, you've got a, a larger audience. Now, that's not to mean that likes are everything. And this is something that a lot of people, again, stumble down, stumble with. Um, you shouldn't chase likes, don't buy likes that is something that will grow over time the more content that you put out there on social media your audience will organically grow um and you know the larger audience you have the better but obviously don't go chasing those likes and pinning all your hopes on getting those likes it's just something a trust signal that will grow over time is the content on your social media interesting is it valuable does it have any worth to your audience they're going to be going well this is completely pointless i'm not really sure why they're posting about this so i'm a bit bored of them now so i'm going to unfollow them how often do you post that's another thing so if you've got a facebook feed and you've not put a, a post on there for six months that's going to set alarm bells off to your potential customer because they're going to go well are they actually still operational are they you know are they still doing stuff are they still selling um do they respond well to queries or complaints? Again, social media makes it really easy for people to talk about you um, and perhaps complain if they've had an issue or they're, they're not happy with something. So you have to make sure that you're on top of it. And does your social media look professional? So things like the tone of voice, which is my next point, your tone of voice, everything that you're writing on there, is it professional? Does it reflect your brand? Um, sense of humor. Um, I think a sense of humor is quite difficult to get right. But if you, I'm not saying that you have to have a sense of humor because that might not be the tone that you're wanting to portray with your brand, but a sense of humor can go a long way. And if you can get it right, it works really well. Um, it shows that you, you know, you are run, you know, the business is run by humans and you're not just a Facebook page. You know, there are people behind it that are putting a lot of thought into the content that goes out there. 
Um, and I think this day and age as well, with everything we've been going through, a bit of a sense of humour can go a long way as well. But obviously only if it, you can get the right tone with that. So the content creation process, um, we talked about customer personas in the last webinar. So customer personas, you want to know exactly who your customer is. So create a profile of who your ideal customer is. So the person that's gonna buy from you, what age are they? Where are they spending their time? What social media do they use? Where are they likely to convert? Um, you know, all their pain points, what they're looking for, what are they asking in Google? You need to understand this and create a, a customer persona. And then your keyword research as well. So who exactly is your customer and what are they looking for? And then understanding what tools you need for this and the time that that's gonna take as well. So tools for keyword research and looking at trends online. So you've got Google, which is free. It's a completely free service to use. Um, you've got Google Keyword Planner. Google Trends is something I absolutely love using because I'm a bit of a geek with things like this. So if you've ever had a look at it, you can refine it down to the UK. When you land on Google Trends, I think it is uh, the default, I think is American. So as long as you change it to the UK, you can then start typing in keywords and you can see the trends um, over time. An example of that recently, we started working with a camper van hire company. Um, and as we were doing a little bit of research for them, what we found was was really astonishing and really quite interesting that the fluctuations through the different times of year of when people are searching for camper van hire obviously you would naturally think it's going to be around summertime and it does so you can see when those peaks in people searching for camper van hire happen so in the springtime so coming into spring people are starting to plan their um their summer trips around the uk and want a camper van to hire so you can see when those peaks and troughs are in them um, people searching in those trends. So then you can start to plan your campaigns so you know that the peak is gonna be around sort of March, April time. You know that you're gonna start running campaigns in the build up to that and through that. So you can curate your, your campaigns based on trends throughout the year. So it's really interesting. Um, don't forget about your Google, Google search console as well. So this gets forgotten about quite a lot. So you have Google Analytics, which you should have implemented on your website which gives you all the traffic information it shows you where your traffic's coming from and how people are using your website you also need to set up google search console which when you create your google search console account um, or property you're verifying it through your google analytics account so it is really easy to do once you know how um, but what google search console does is it shows you all the keywords that people have searched and then you have appeared for so it shows you what um, what people have typed into Google and then whether how many people have seen you um, through those searches and then what clicks were generated from those searches. So again, it's a really valuable tool to use. Um, and then you can pay for something like Moz. This is something that a lot of agencies use, moz.com, um, which helps in search engine optimization keyword research. That is a paid one. I think they've got some free tools. I haven't looked actually, I should have looked before I came into the webinar. Um, so there's moz.com, wordstream.com is another free tool, SEM Rush. If anybody's got any others that they may use, please do put it in the chat because um, there is absolutely loads out there, different types of tools that you can use for keyword research and trends research online. Um, so if anybody's got anything, please pop it in the chat for everybody to see, that would be great. So I gave you a quick overview of this in the last webinar, but I wanted to talk about this a little bit more. So when you're planning your content and your campaigns, I start it in late. I always do it in layers. So I start with my first layer is looking at a year. So you have a year to view. I do this in a spreadsheet um, or I start in a spreadsheet. You can also use different tools like Asana or Monday.com. There's loads of different ones out there that you can pay for. Spreadsheet is free and you can set it up exactly how you want it. So this is an example of my campaign planner. So my marketing planner gives me a year to view. It goes all the way through to December. Um, and I put everything in there. So I'll start with your school holidays and bank holidays because, you know, things happen around school holidays. It can be something that affects your business. Um, national events of note. So in there, I've sort of, I've deleted quite a lot out of here because I, I didn't want to show everything, but I didn't want to give everything away um, of what we're doing. But what I thought I'd do is just show you around International Women's Day, which you can see there, week 10, 
of the year, week commencing the 8th of March, um, there is International Women's Day. So I've started to build campaigns around that. So I'm doing my Fresh Start campaign, which is going to be around the talk that I'm doing. So that's going to be the main event that I'm doing um, on the 8th of March. Building up to that, I'm going to do a, a couple of bits. So there's going to be a blog that's going out. Um, then I'm going to be putting lots out on social media the week before. And then on the week, there's just going to be loads of content going out. So this, this layer, so your campaign planner, whatever you want to call it, layer one, part one of your campaign planning, your content planning, this is very much just a visual timeline. So if you've ever heard of a Gantt chart, which is used in project management, it's a similar sort of thing. This is just a simplified version of that. You can make them really elaborate and put budgets in there. Um, you can put as much information in there as you want to. I keep it really simple, color coded. So I know this event is gonna happen on the week commencing the 8th of March. So what do I need to do around that? So you start with when the event is, and then you build all your content around that. So the useful page of international days or events that might be relevant. That's a good question, actually. Um, if anyone knows of any websites, um, I'm trying to think myself of international days or events that might be relevant to different industries. Andrew, that's a good question. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but if you Google it, you end up finding quite a lot. So if you if you just pop to Google and have a look, yeah, exactly. Google is our friend. Um, you do get loads of different calendars and, and industry specific um, calendars with different types of events that are going on. And it does take a little bit of research. You may have to go through quite a few web websites and have a look around um, the internet. Um, then you can start to build up your campaign plan. And then from that point, you see what I'm doing here, You you then, start to work out your channels what's going to go out where so this is the very first layer don't put too much information in this keep it really simple really visual and then you can work towards this so then I go to layer two and this is where then I create my month to view um, and you can see daily again you can use calendar I do this in um, excel you can use asana I think I've got that on the next slide actually yeah Asana, monday.com, which is really good for just um, sort of compiling and organizing what you need to do. Um, Asana is much more task list based. Monday.com is task list based, but you can add in a lot more to it. Um, they're both paid, um, paid subscriptions, by the way. Again, Excel is free and you can just configure it exactly how you want. So layer two, you're thinking about your topic. So this is where you could even use this to write, you know, you're creating the headlines for your blogs or the posts that you're putting out there. So on International Women's Day, um, on the 8th of Monday, the 8th of March, I've got that highlighted there. And there I'm gonna do my fresh start guide. That's gonna go, be going out on social media. Um, on Tuesday, I'm gonna be doing my Tuesday tips, the top three tips to refresh in your direction. I'm gonna do three Insta posts and stories. Um, then on the Wednesday, I know to make sure that I'm putting out there about my the talk recording that's gonna be released. Um, and there's going to be a lead generation form on there as well. So people will have to give me their emails in exchange for a copy of the video um, of the talk. And it goes through. So layer two is very much you're now starting to sort of brainstorm and put in more information as to what needs to be done and what channels are going to be put out there. So you can make this as elaborate or as simple as possible. Um, it is like a brainstorming session, really. But then at least you've got it there and you know. So I know that International Women's Day, 8th of March, I've got a lot of work to do. So I need to make sure that at least a month beforehand, I want everything ready to go. So you then start to work backwards. Do everything in as much um, as far in advance as possible, if that makes sense. So set your deadlines of when this work is going to be created. This chart shows you when it's going to be published on social media. Don't leave it to the day to do the content, to write the content, because you are just going to be constantly chasing your tail. Everything needs to be done in advance. You know, in the advertising and marketing industry, people get things done months and months and months in advance because there's so much production and so much time that has to go into creation. Um, so, I mean, at the moment, I'm working on um, advertising for a company that I work for. Let's have a think. We are working on adverts that are going out in August at the moment. 
and then we start thinking about Christmas and I do a lot of Christmas campaigns um, in summer, getting them ready for the build up to Christmas. So you've got to work, try and get everything as far ahead in advance as possible. I'm probably teaching you to suck eggs here. I mean, everybody works in different ways, but I know with small businesses, it is a lot harder to try and get ahead. But the further ahead that you can get with the work that you're doing and the content that you have to create, the better. Um, so we talked about that. So writing content then. So the best ways to write content, I always say write for your customer persona, know who they are, know how they talk, know, you know, what sort of jargon they're gonna understand and what they're not gonna understand, write to them, you're writing for them. Put the benefit of your content in the title and let them know why you should read it. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples in a moment. Stick to one idea per post. So that's per blog, per social media post. Don't go off on tangents because then you start to confuse them. Make sure that for every piece of content you are sticking to one topic. Um, just to keep it nice and simple. Again, don't try to impress your audience with eloquent prose. Um, you're not Shakespeare. We don't have to be like Shakespeare. This is the internet. This is you are trying to tell your customers what you do and why you do it and why they should buy from you. You're giving them answers. You don't have to make this um, like you're writing a novel. It doesn't have to be really descriptive. It just has to be to the point and it has to show and showcase your expertise and know, you know, show them that you know what you're talking about. And then being concise and clear, I think that sort of sums it all up really. You want your audience to relate to you and derive value from your content and not have to sift through jargon or confusing metaphors. So that speaks for itself really. Just, it's gotta be really clear. Not only are you writing for your customer in a way you are writing for Google as well. Um, and if you've got really descriptive prose in there and big long jargon, that's not gonna help your search engine optimization strategy. So here are some ideas. Now, without going to clickbaity, um, I thought I'd put together a few, um, these are sort of tried and tested headlines. Um, so I've actually taken these from um, Girls in Marketing, which is a, a group on, they're on LinkedIn, they're on Facebook, they're all over the place. I get loads of ideas from them. They put loads of these types of things out there. Um, and they put a post out about sort of nice, clear headlines that you can use that work, um, that hook people in. And I thought these were really good. So things like the X best ways to something without something. So an example there would be something like the 10 best ways to gain leads without annoying your audience. Um, let's talk about employee well-being. If you're an employee well-being or a um, an employee engagement expert. So let's talk about employee wellbeing. That's what it says, you know, that's what your blog post is about. It does what it says in the title. Um, doing product comparisons is really, it's really good. I've seen clients, there was a client of mine that I started working with last year um, and I did an audit for them and they have one blog. They've got loads of blogs on their website but they had one that was doing amazingly and it's still to this day, is one of the top performing pages on their website. And all it is, is a comparison. They're a, a kitchen company. So it's, they've done a comparison of Neff versus Seaman ovens. Se Siemens, oh, <laughs> Siemens, there's an S on the end there. Neff versus Siemens ovens, um, which is best? They wrote that a couple of years ago. It's still one of the top performing pages. They go in and refresh it every now and again and add a little bit more information. Um, but it, it just does remarkably well. Doing things like product reviews, service reviews um, is really good because people are asking that, those types of questions to Google. Um, here's everything you need to know about UCAS applications. I know that we've got a couple of people from Sheffield University um, with us today, hello. Um, something like that. So something, here's everything you need to know about UCAS applications um, is, it does what it says. It's something that people are going to be Googling. They want to know about UCAS and how it all works and what they need to be doing within their, their application, etc. cetera. Um, five mistakes to avoid when working with a virtual assistant. We've got lots of virtual assistants on with us today as well. So you're trying to find ways that you're, you're giving information to your customers that they're going to be Googling and they're going to find you and then read about you. They're going to read your expertise and they're going to build that trust with you. So some examples, I've taken these from Mortgage Advice Bureau. Um, 
these are really nice examples. Mortgage Advice Bureau has some really good, um, really good content on the website. It's, you know, they come up really high on Google whenever you're Googling anything about mortgage advice, anything about mortgages. Um, and they're, you know, really good example of really clear, concise, to the point information. So how to get a mortgage when you're single does what it says on the tin. Help to buy explained, how to buy a house. So they're really simple, short um, titles. Um, now, when we talk about a range of different types of content, using things like videos and using a mix um, of different types of content, so videos, blogs, um, how-to guides, downloadable content is really good. So there's a, there's a company, I have absolutely no affiliation with this company whatsoever. It's a company called Kiravans, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, we've just bought a camper van, so obviously we're kind of obsessing over all the different things that come along with a camper van and going camping. Um, so. <laughs> This company I'm really impressed with and I've spent a lot of time on their website, actually. Um, I get hooked into how other companies, how brands um, deliver their content and this, this website's really good. So Kira Vans, they use, they put loads of videos out there, how-to videos, explaining product reviews. Um, they've got one there comparing two portable toilets. I never thought I would get to a point in my life where I would be looking at comparisons of port portable toilets, but here we are. Um, so <laughs> Um, they've got loads of videos on there. They've also got loads of blogs on there. Again, what are the best vans for a camper van conversion? That answers the question. Um, top five camper van products. So they're really, you know, there's a real good mix. It's really simple. The headlines do exactly what they say. They showcase their expertise. So now you want to be thinking, now that you've got all your topics and you've got a big plan of, um, campaigns that you're going to be running over the next 12 months that's how far ahead in advance you can get with this you can sit there and it doesn't take a lot of time actually to think on your calendar of where you need to start thinking about campaigns um once you've done that you've got your topics you know what you're going to be writing about once you've done that you then need to think about things like social cards so how does this content how is it going to be presented to your audience so social cards i wanted to put that in here because it's really easy to forget about and if you haven't quite got the technical skills or you don't quite know how to do it, it's something that can make a massive difference if you learn how to do it. So social cards are, it's the name for how your posts or your web pages appear on social media. So when you have a blog post and you're ready to share it on social media, you copy and paste the URL and you pop it into your Facebook post. And then what's called a social card appears. So that is the image and then the headline. You have complete control over how this appears. Um, I know it's really frustrating. Sometimes you're copying and pasting a link into Facebook and the headline appears really messy. Um, it doesn't fit on the social card. It doesn't have an image. It doesn't bring an image up. And it just looks messy and a little bit unprofessional. And you're kind of hoping, you were hoping that there wasn't going to be an image there that's going to hook people in. But then you realize I can't post this blog post on Facebook because it just doesn't look good. So your social card, You've got control over how the headline appears and you can actually, if you've got a WordPress website, I'm sorry, I don't know much. Yes, um, this is social card is the same for LinkedIn. So a social card appears on Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I think those are the three. So when you're copying and pasting links to any of those three, then this is how, you know, you, you get a social card. It's a visual representation of the blog. So it shows you here, it shows you, the headline you can write that in a shorter way so that it fits on your social card um you've then got control over the image that appears and then you can then write a little bit of a hook at the top as well so you've got sort of three points there to hook a, a person into reading the blog so on wordpress um I haven't used much in the way of any other um, website building platforms. Um, we use WordPress and we build WordPress and bespoke code WordPress. So we don't even use themes we, or templates or anything like that. We use a developer theme. So we build a Word, uh, WordPress site completely bespoke to a client. Um, there is a plugin on WordPress called Yoast. Um, so if anybody else has got any other website like on Wix or anything like that, if they could just share whether they know if there's the way to change social cards and have any control over them, then please do share in the chat. But on WordPress, in Yoast, what you can do is you can tailor the headline so that it's even shorter 
than how it appears on your website. It's even shorter so that you know it's going to fit in the space on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Um, you can change the image. Um, so what generally happens is you'll have something called a featured image that you'll put into your blog post. And if you just leave the featured image, then Facebook will just pull the featured image. But if you're wanting a completely tailored photo for Facebook, you can separate it out so you can put a separate um, image for Facebook so it appears differently. So it's all about grabbing the attention and making everything really professional and really just look good on your social media feeds. Um, so it is something that takes a little bit of nap. There are, all the, there are all these little quirks with social cards that you have to get around. So if you're changing them, if you want to refresh the image, um, if you've updated the blog, for example, and you want to put a different image in, you've got to do something called URL scraping. So you go to something called LinkedIn has it. Um, I think Twitter has it and Facebook has it um, where you go to the Facebook debugging um, and then you have to scrape the URL and it basically clears the cache and it refreshes the image. So there is a little bit of technical knowledge that's needed um, when you're refreshing and using working with social cards. Once you know how, it's really easy. But I am happy for anybody to just give me a call. If you've been on this webinar, just let me know um, and I'll show you how to do it if it's something that you get stuck on more than happy to because I hate seeing um, articles that have been really well written that then just don't appear on Facebook or on, on LinkedIn very well it just completely spoils it. So talking about social media um, best practices with Facebook what is really easy to fall down on is expecting Facebook to do all the selling you know to be a selling platform so Facebook your organic page unless you're using Facebook ads which is a different thing. If you're posting on your Facebook pages, your business page, use it as a snapshot of your brand. So this is a drip media. It's something that grows organically. The more that you're posting and the more valuable, um, informative, engaging content that you're putting out there, the more organically your audience will grow, um, the more engagement you'll get and it will help. But it's a drip media. It's something that takes time to build up and it takes time to get right and understand what your audience wants. Um, don't rely on your organic content to sell. Don't sell, sell, sell. Don't just put a product on there. This is 50% off, buy this because it's just not gonna work. You use your Facebook advertising for that. So that's your separate strategy. Um, if you're wanting the quick sell, consider Facebook advertising. It's got a much shorter sales funnel. Um, using your Facebook page has to be all around your organic growth and it takes time. And that's where your content strategy that's my dog having a drink in the background. I don't know if you can hear him. <laughs> Chewy, come on. Thank you. Um, using a variety of content, things like pictures, videos, not just constantly posting the same, you know, you just post a picture, then a picture, then a picture, then a picture, although they can be really nice and it can tell a really nice story for your brand. Try and do a variety. So post a picture one day um, of something that's going on in your brand. The next day, post a blog. The next day, have a video the next day um, post a customer review you know keeping it the more varied you keep it the better so with LinkedIn I mean I don't want to go into too much detail about LinkedIn Instagram Facebook because that you know you could do a whole webinar on each one so with LinkedIn I always say that positivity goes a long way it's it is very much built on the content that you're putting out there on LinkedIn the posts that you put out there will always do better if it is positive if it's a good news story um, if you're making an announcement over something really positive, it works really well. Um, and that's what it's built for. Your profile is there to sell you as a person, but the, the posts that you put out there and that you're interacting with your connections has to be just really nice and positive and tell really good stories. Um, and then don't forget that you've also got your own personal profile. You've got your personal profile and you've also got the ability to have a business page, much like on Facebook. Um, it's easy to forget your business page. And then Instagram, I have fallen back in love with Instagram a little bit. Um, and the reason why is because I've recently gone back onto uh, recently, um, recently joined Clubhouse. I don't know if anybody's on Clubhouse. I've fallen in love with it. And I honestly believe Clubhouse is going to go absolutely massive. It's already big, but I think it's going to get even more massive when they make it more accessible. Um, it is a fantastic platform and I have got so much out of it. But the reason why Instagram is sort of, I, I've seen this sort of influx of professionals using Instagram 
um, over the last few months because of Clubhouse, because you use your Instagram profile almost as your kind of landing page um, from Clubhouse. So you be in a room on Club. I don't know if you're if you're if you're completely um, you have no idea what I'm talking about because it's new. But Clubhouse is an audio based social network. So you're going into rooms and you're having live conversations with people. Um, or you can just sit in the audience and you're listening to a panel of people chatting and then you can put your hand up and ask questions. It's completely in the moment. It is a dialogue that you're having with other business owners um, or you know other people. There's all sorts of different topics that are in there. When you're in there chatting and you've got, it shows your profile picture, you click on the profile picture and then you have a little bit of information there, but then you link your Instagram profile to it. So then your Instagram profile kind of becomes your little website landing page. Um, so that I'm talking about Clubhouse, I, I sound like I'm working for Clubhouse. I'm not, I just love it. I think it's fantastic. And if you've got the opportunity to be on it, please do. Um, so there's different elements to Instagram. So you've got your photo grid, which should be nice and eye catching. And that tells a story of your brand. That used to be the sole component of Instagram. It's now evolved where you've now got things like Instagram stories and reels, which is quite a new thing. You've also got Instagram TV. All these different components can work really well. I think since Facebook took over Instagram, um, they've done a lot of work. And I think now it is really good for business, really good platform for, for showcasing your business and your expertise. Um, so you'll get a slightly higher reach and engagement by using things like um, stories and reels. Stories are like little snippets of things that are going on in your day. You can, put, you can actually be really creative and create little storylines. That's what it's there for. Um, the only show for 24 hours so it's a little bit more fast paced and in the moment and then reels is Instagram's answer to TikTok um, so TikTok which <laughs> has become the bane of my life and I've actually had to stop myself from going on it it is so addictive TikTok is one of these things where you literally go onto it and then you're met with lots of different silly videos um, and you sit there for hours just scrolling through videos and you get completely sucked into it um the difference with instagram reels i think they've got the algorithm a lot better on instagram and um, it is much more focused because they've got a lot more data on you as a user they know the types of businesses that you're following um, they know what products you're into they know um they know who you're interacting with who you're talking to and what what you actually enjoy um, so Instagram Reels is a lot more curated, I think. I think it's a lot better. So I, you know, depending on who you are and what you do within your business, if you've got a business Instagram account, you'll find that on Reels, you'll get a lot more relevant stuff on there. So it is a really good platform um, that I've sort of fallen back in love with. So I wanted to give you an example of, oh, that was a nice animation. Um, I wanted to give you an example of a Facebook um, account that I have been managing for quite a long time so this is a very niche business but it is a fantastic example of how you can just get to a point where your customers look after your marketing for you so um, Metcalf Models and Toys is a manufacturer of um, model railway buildings so they're printed on card um, and they're flat packed um, and then people buy them and build them up and then create these amazing scenes. It is a hobby. It's really niche. So I look after their Facebook page and I have done for a long time. Um, and the Facebook page, I basically, my formula for it is one day I will post images from a customer. The next day I'll post a little video of the inside the factory. And then I'll give a little bit of an insight into the factory on another post. So here we go. We've got a picture of a lovely castle that somebody's built. That's one of the models. Then you've got a video, a slow-mo video of the guillotine chopping card. And then there's a little behind scenes footage of uh, Nick Metcalf. That is actually my dad. <laughs> Bless him doing his thing on his computer. So um, it's a little bit of insight. It's really engaging. They get massive engagement. Again, it's really niche. But then you get to a point where you're constantly getting really good um, content from your customers. So they had this amazing letter from Diane, who was 92, she's disabled. And she wrote this beautiful letter just saying how much she values um, Metcalf models and what, you know, the products that she buys. Um, I put that out there and that had massive, massive engagement. People just saying, oh, it's amazing. Um, absolutely agree. Things like competitions as well. So we all run competitions throughout the year. Um, 
competitions go a long way and I've added in at the bottom there you can just see the engagement that we got with that so it reached 51,000 people um, over a week had 7,000 engagements it was shared 753 times so and all it was was a competition to, people love a freebie it was a competition to win a little bundle of um, tools and a couple of the products um, people love a freebie if you have the ability to be able to run a competition then I do recommend it don't do them all the time we will run them maybe once a month at the most and um, we did them quite a lot through the first lockdown um, and then we sort of backed off from it a little bit because it starts to lose its value otherwise and you can see the engagement starts to drop a little bit so we've stopped doing them for a while but you don't have to be giving away if you're a, you know you you don't necessarily have a product that you feel is going to be that attractive for a competition giveaway that's going to give you a massive boost um, in engagement you can also um, use other products so I know a mortgage advisor who um, basically was giving away a Betty's hamper um, from Betty's tea rooms and that got massive engagement and she suddenly had this massive influx of people following her and it works really well and then since then she's suddenly gone do you know what I actually see the value in Facebook I'm going to do more on here and then she's she's built up a following and she puts out loads of information she does loads of videos answering questions as a mortgage advisor giving advice doing live videos that kind of thing um just from doing that one competition she suddenly went oh there is an audience here so you can you know you can use a competition to your advantage i'm very conscious of time so i'm going to try and uh, wrap this up in a moment so facebook groups then is where if you've got the ability to be able to create a community around your brand so with Metcalf models we have a Facebook group so the page has um I think 7,000 followers no 9,000 followers the group has just under 8,000 uh, members so the, the group is an exclusive group you have to ask to join um, and then once you're in there it becomes a forum so you're talking to other customers of the brand so people are putting all sorts of photos on there giving each other advice um sharing lots of nice little photos of what they've been doing and it kind of becomes its own you know your own little customer service desk because people start asking questions and then other customers are answering it for them um so it's kind of its own little marketing sort of bubble that's just sort of fizzling away in the background and it's got a really really engaged following and then things like this happen so um this year somebody posted about how good the customer service was and they put this in the group no we didn't provoke them we didn't ask them to do this it was just a post one well, who was really happy with the service they got they we then got absolutely inundated with people giving their experience of how good so you know it was just constant how good the company was how good the customer service was how much they value the brand and it just went on and on and on and we were absolutely blown away. So there is an example of how you can let your customers do your marketing for you. If you can get to a point where you've got this community of following, you've got a platform for your customers to talk to each other. And if your marketing as a whole is so good that you, your customer service is absolutely on point, your products are fantastic, they love you, they're going to want to advocate you and they're going to want to tell each other about how good you are and how happy they are with your brand. So there's another way you know, the marketing for Metcalf Models is so easy to manage because it's such a good company um, that customers absolutely value. So that, I was going to go through these examples on Instagram. I don't know if we've got five. Has anybody got any questions? I'll pause for questions. I've got literally two more slides of, I was just going to give you an example of Instagram. Um, I'll keep going then. So on clubhouse i've started following quite a lot of people because i go into these rooms on clubhouse and i listen to people talk and then you end up following them on instagram so this was one guy john lee has three million followers or just under three million followers this is how he uses his instagram and i find it quite in interesting so his photo grid which you can see underneath his profile he just posts lots of nice things so there's you know lots of anecdotes lots of little bits of tips and advice alongside that he then uses Instagram reels so Instagram reels will be him talking it'll be giving him giving a little bit of insight into his life his personal life but it's all based around building his own personal brand um so he uses reels 
then he uses Instagram TV where he'll be putting out valuable content that actually answers questions. So he's got this real mix and a lot of brands do this. If you can go onto Instagram and just spend a bit of time um, looking at how other businesses do it um, and how they curate all the different types of, um, all the different variant, vari variables of marketing, that's not a sentence, but you know what I mean, all the different types of um, content that they can put out there that they utilize, you know, it's a really great platform to do that. And then again, just to give you, a, go back to Kiravan because I've become obsessed with camper vans. Um, this company, again, really good. So they have got their profile that's nice and short and sweet. Um, they use, so the little circles, they, those are story highlights. So they utilize story highlights. So they basically categorize all the stories that, and you can get really creative with that. And then the content feed itself, um, it's nice and visually appealing. Um, you get that in your feed when you log into Instagram, obviously. Then they utilize um, Instagram TV. Um, so all the videos that they're creating on YouTube, they're also putting onto their Instagram as well. So it's all there, They've, you know, it's all really varied. And then again, what they've got is they've got a following of customers that are then tagging them in. So that last um, screenshot on the right is customer photos that they've been tagged into so all the customers then are starting to create content for them so if you get again you get to this point where your customers are creating content for you it is so beneficial to be able to do that and to try and focus on that so there is a little bit of a whistle stop tour of different types of content that you can create I've just noticed that we've got a question uh can you add a podcast to Instagram uh oh I wouldn't recommend it, or would I? Let me think about this. I've never thought about doing this before. Because Instagram is a visual thing, if you were wanting, yeah, you could. So if you were wanting to add a podcast to Instagram, what I would recommend is that you create um, a visual graphic. Um, I have a podcast, by the way, which is Fem Powered Collective UK, uh, which has just launched and we've got another episode coming out next week. Thought I'd get that plug in there. Um, I have a podcast and what you can do when you, I use something called Buzzsprout to host mine, whatever um, hosting service you use for your podcast, um, you can create little visual graphics. Um, so they're like little sound waves so that you can then post a little snippet of your podcast on um, social media. If you can po get a visual graphic, for your podcast it depends how long your podcast is though if it was an hour long I don't know if that would be worthwhile doing might be something to try you just need to be able to create a visual that you can put the sound onto the sound of your podcast onto and see whether it works see whether people listen to it I wouldn't recommend it I would recommend actually thinking about it thinking aloud here I would recommend putting clips of your podcast to try and direct people to your podcast pl platform that's how I would do it there you go. <laughs> Got there eventually. So yeah, I wouldn't put a full podcast on Instagram. I would um, do a little clips that you then direct people to your podcast. Uh, Michelle, how do you use hashtags in stories? I hear these help content engagement, but not sure how to add them. Um, I think you just type them in. Um, if you type a hashtag onto in using the text editor, I think that still uh, Instagram will still identify that as a hashtag. However, you don't get people following you um, through the hashtag on stories, I don't believe. Um, it's not something I would do. You would tend to just use your hashtags on the other content um, on your posts that you're putting out on the photo grid. Um, and then also, in reels you can use hashtags and instagram tv you can use hashtags as well i don't think using hashtags is actually on stories is actually of any benefit um so i hope that answers your question i don't think um i can see a few of you having to just leave i know we're at two o'clock i'm going to stay on and answer any more questions but don't worry if you have to go um not a problem whatsoever hope you found it useful thank you very much for joining me um and i know quite a few of you are still hanging on so i'm going to sit here and i will carry on answering any more questions but thank you so much um and if you can join if you're interested in joining the 
um, strategy webinar that I'm going to be doing in a couple of weeks, please do go back onto the Yorkshire Mafia and sign up for that. Um, it is sort of mainly a it's focused on established SMEs um, that are wanting to step up their um, the marketing strategy. So it's probably where this uh, webinar was more beginner intermediate. I'd say the next webinar is going to be more intermediate upwards. So, um, but definitely worthwhile if you're an established business. But thank you all so much for joining me. Um, if there's any more questions, I will hang on. And I'll take the fact that there's not many questions that I've actually hopefully answered, um, answered your questions. How is it, the have I got this? I've just realized that I've got that on there. I don't know if you could see the Q and A that was on the wrong screen, sorry about that. How is the best way to contact you in regards to social cards? There is my emails on the screen right now. Hopefully you can see that sophie at fempowercollective.co.uk or sophie at the sophiegroup.co.uk. If you drop me an email, and then I will send you my calendar link so you can book a little bit of time with me. It'll probably be a 15 minute call. I'm happy to do that. Um, but please do email me first and then I'll just I'll drop the um, drop the calendar link to you so you can just book a bit of my time. Which, by the way, you can do through HubSpot. <laughs> so I'm going to give HubSpot a little plug. You can um, you can basically set up a calendar that integrates with if you've got Outlook, it integrates with your Outlook calendar so that you can send a link. Because it's really annoying when you are having a conversation with someone on email and you go, OK, let's book a call. When are you free? I don't know. When are you free? Well, I'm free next week. How about Thursday or Friday? And then it goes backwards and forwards where the easiest thing to do is just send people a link. Here's my calendar. You pick a time. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll do that. So just drop me an email and then I'll, um, I'll send that back to you. Um, thank you so much. Oh, I'm so pleased you all got something out of this. Really pleased. That's always my goal. I'm also really, really impressed with Chewy that he didn't bark because there's been people walking past the door. Normally, he goes absolutely mental. <laughs> so um, I think the big bone that I bought him was uh, was definitely worthwhile. A few of you still hanging on, still here if you want to ask any questions. That's Chewy in the background drinking his water. He is not a quiet drinker. Bless him. Perfect. Well, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So I will end it there. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, see you soon. <laughs>